This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. So if you want to open your Bibles, I think there's pew Bibles now, or one you've brought with you, or on your um, device, we're going to look at Philippians. And Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse um, 18. I'm not sure what page it is in the Pew Bibles, but it's Philippians chapter 1, um, starting at page 18. This is, um, this is God's word to us this evening. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor, labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus, will abound on account of me. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are not remote or distant, but that we can bring our prayers and requests to you. And not only that, but you long to hear from us. Um, Father, the weather reminds us that the summer is over. And we want to thank you for farmers and others who grow crops and tend to animals to ensure that we have food on our tables. And in the midst of new stories about empty shelves and other difficulties, we pray for wisdom for those who need to make decisions about how the food we get eat gets from farm to our fridges and shelves and for safety for those who work to make that happen. We pray for those who worry about how they will put food on their table and give thanks for organisations like Storehouse, although it is our hope and prayer that such organisations would not need to exist. We want to bring before you the government's proposal to remove the uplift to universal credit, recognising that this has become a vital lifeline for many people. And Father, we plead for a compassionate response from legislators and policymakers. Closer to home, we pray for those in our congregation who have been recently bereaved, and we ask that you bring them comfort and peace at this difficult time. We pray too for those waiting for hospital treatment or waiting on results of tests, and we ask that you would calm their fears and that they would receive appropriate assistance at the right time. We also bring before you our students who have gone or who will go shortly to university away from home. Father, we pray for your protection over them, that you would guard their hearts and their minds and their souls. We ask that you would bring good people into their lives as friends and mentors, and for good lines of communication within families separated by distance. And finally, we give you thanks for our brother Graham, and we pray that you would anoint him with your goodness and grace as he speaks to us, and that our ears would be open to what you would have us hear. In Jesus' name, amen. The bad news for Karen is the older you get, the more nervous you get when you're up front here. <coughs> it's lovely to be with you. I'm a bit hoarse, but I hope it'll be okay tonight. Uh, first of all, thanks to the praise team for as ever leading us in worship that draws us close to God. And uh, I also want to thank our minister, Frank, for inviting me to uh, share in this service. I, I, I really appreciated that invitation. And uh, 
it's lovely to be with you. And there's no greater privilege in, in my life than in all our lives, in fact, than opening up God's Word to someone. And I just would ask for a moment as we pray together, Lord, we just ask for your Spirit to continue moving in our minds and hearts, that your Word would find swift um, entrance into our lives yet again to comfort and challenge to inspire us and to drive us out that we might be lights in this world that is so dark. Lord, may we know that it's good to be here because we meet with you in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you uh, have a Bible handy, it would be good to turn to the passage, uh, Philippians chapter 1, beginning at, at verse 18. Um, it's a familiar passage to many of us, particularly that verse, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I remember having a, a conversation with a former member of staff here who in a sermon said, I'm ready to go but eager to stay. And on the Tuesday morning, I had a discussion with him because I felt that was the wrong way round. And I do think that I'm, I'm on Paul's side here that I'm eager to go but ready to stay. And we'll see why he was ready to stay and why we should be ready to stay as we look at this passage. In these verses and in this letter, Paul is concerned about his life and, interesting enough, concerned about his body. He refers to his body a number of times. And it's easy to see why when we realize that he's probably chained in prison. He's probably been beaten up fairly regularly and he's not in great physical shape. One of the atheists in our day who has gone to face the Lord, Christopher Hitchens, died not so long ago, and in his final book, he wrote some of the most chilling words I have ever heard. He says this, I do not have a body, I am a body. And when you think about that, Christopher Hitchens is saying that the moment he died, the moment his body really began to disintegrate, Christopher Hitchens no longer existed. Well, although Paul's thinking about his body, he sees it in a very different way. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, having met the risen Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, he is telling us that Hitchens is wrong. And Graciously and quietly, we will meet people who believe what Hitchens believed, and we need to tell them they're wrong. Paul is looking at something that is much greater than this physical body that we have, which is important, of course, because one day it will be remade into a glorious body, each of us uniquely given a new body linked to our old that will never get sick, never age, in the sense that we understand, never be tired, never die again. And in these verses we're looking at, as in the letter to Philippians, we're thinking about rejoicing, about joy, and particularly in these verses, rejoicing in life and death. And I want to point out just three things where we find joy in these verses. There are lots of other things, of course, even in this letter, let alone the Bible, where Christians can find true, solid joys the things we were singing about in that last hymn. And I want to suggest to you that in these verses, we can find joy in hope, in freedom, and in service. You'll see there, first of all, joy or rejoicing in hope in verses 19 and 20. I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. What's your hope? Of course, we use hope in a very different way to the way the Bible describes hope. We hope for things that might happen. I had hoped for a better result, unless the second half was better than the first in the North London Derby today, and I'm guessing it wasn't. I had hoped that I would go swimming and maybe even see Matt tomorrow morning, but they don't open the pool at the time that I want to swim anymore, so I miss my swimming and I miss my conversations with Matt. 
I hope for these things, but some of them happen and some of them don't. The Bible doesn't use that word hope, the word hope in that way at all. In, in, in Scripture, when we read hope, it speaks of confidence, of utter confidence. It's almost the opposite to the way we use it today. It might happen. No, I'm confident. I'm confident it's going to happen. It's the mentality that comes from believing that all things, as Karen was reminding us earlier, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And what Paul is confident for is really quite amazing as you look there. He's confident that what has happened to him will work out for his deliverance. He's in prison in Rome. He's writing to the church in Philippi. And what happened when Paul was in prison in Philippi? You remember? The walls fell down. There was an earthquake. He escaped. But he's talking about a different kind of deliverance here. This will turn out for my deliverance, turn out for my, literally, salvation. Now, that word, of course, is rich and means lots of things to us, don't we? Uh, usually, we think about salvation in something that has happened to us in the past, and particularly in Northern Ireland and Belfast. Many people would have said, oh, well, I was saved at such and such a time in my life or in such and such a season in my life. But, of course, the Bible uses the word salvation in lots of different ways, doesn't it? Salvation does mean, of course, saved from the penalty, from the power, from the presence, and from the pleasure of sin. And Paul says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so he calls us in chapter 2, verse 12, as we were looking previous Sunday, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in us. And back in verse 6 of chapter 1, he says, I'm sure of this, the idea of confident hope, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus tonight, there's great news. What God has started in your life and mine, he will complete. God planned from the beginning before time was made to finish his work in each one of us who love Jesus. God's never late in that work. He's never in a hurry. He doesn't always do it to our timetable, but he will finish what he starts. Psalm 139 says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He knows your time. He knows my time. Isn't that wonderful? I don't know my time. You don't know yours. But he doesn't make mistakes. And Paul has this joyful hope that what God starts, he will complete. He has it because of the Holy Spirit living in his life. Because of your prayers, he says, that were given for me, the help given by the Spirit, I know through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Certain hope. It's not just that God is in charge of all the circumstances that are around our lives. Of course he is. But also that God lives in us. I find that one of the most astonishing truths of the gospel. It's enough, isn't it, at Christmas time or any other time of the year to think that God came to earth and took human form and became one like us and with us, but he does it in every believer as the Holy Spirit lives in you and lives in me. And you show glimpses of that Spirit to me and to others, and I hope in my life I show glimpses of that to you. But, of course, this hope is centered also in prayer in the Christian life, isn't it? This Spirit, he says, is supplied in answer to prayer. In chapter 1, verse 3, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. And he knows the Philippians are praying for him. And they were praying a very simple prayer. Basically, weren't they saying, Father, send your Spirit to help 
our friend Paul. Ephesians 6 and 19 and Ephesians and Philippians are like sister letters. He writes, Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I'll fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. I wonder, is that part of your prayer life and mine? Do we pray for for Frank and the, the team here, for our elders, for the leaders of organizations, for the praise teams? for our friends in the congregation, for folk we don't yet know, that we will be able to fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And we pray that for others, that the Holy Spirit will take us and shape us and help us to do that. Wouldn't that be a wonderful prayer to start praying if we haven't done it yet? And that's what they're praying. Pray for Frank. Pray for the staff team. Pray for our elders that the Spirit will grip them and that they will be able to be fearless. And as they are that kind of men and women, we will follow and be fearless too. And he goes on and he says he eagerly expects. I, I have a picture in my mind of somebody who is trying to reach out for something that's very high up, maybe on a, um, a a wardrobe or something above there, something that they're not quite sure, and they're on tiptoe, and they're reaching out, and it's almost in grasp. And as you do that, you're focusing and you're concentrating on what you're about to receive and take. Look what he says, I pray, my hope is that Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. He says, pray for me. There's guards around me. I want you to pray that as the guards look at me in all my weakness, that they will see the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will honor him with their lives given to him. Pray for me that I'll not be ashamed. Imagine, this is is the apostle who, who was left for dead on a number of occasions, who was stoned, who was thrown out. He says, pray for me that I won't be ashamed, but speak with boldness. And literally, he says that Christ would be enlarged in my body. Christ would be magnified. Christ would be made great. Christ would be conspicuous. The word I like to use is that Christ will be placarded. Um, I, as many of you know, I grew up uh, near Leganil in North Belfast, and there's a, a, a turn in the road there called the Horseshoe Bend. And there used to be a sign up, it's long gone, Belfast four miles. I thought that was bizarre because Belfast was just down the road. But of course, it was the center of the town. And you could see the whole city from up there. You could even see the Wild East, <laughs> which we never, I know you never crossed the river north and we never crossed the river east. Foreign country, that's why I came as a missionary here. <laughs> um, but there was a sign telling you Belfast. You, you couldn't miss it. And Paul's saying our lives are to be like that. He uses the illustration of an open book that people can read. One person translates it this way, and I think this is wonderful. My body, I want my body to be the theater in which Christ is displayed. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. I used to go to the gym uh, I admired John at the gym. You know, I could never be anywhere near as fit as him. Uh, but you meet people at the gym, don't you? And all they're interested in is displaying their body. It's all about them. It's all about glorifying them. Now, it's a noble thing to be fit. Wish I was. But in a sense, they can be posing. Paul's not saying that. He's concerned that his life, his body that he speaks of, will glorify the Lord Jesus, that his hands will glorify him, that his lips will glorify him, that every part of his body will be used to glorify Jesus. This is his joyful hope. Is it ours? Well, we're not, we're not Pentecostal, so we keep quiet, don't we? <laughs> Thank you, sister. Joyful hope. Secondly, joyful freedom, verses 21 to 24. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What is this glorious freedom that people who are believers have? 
Well, listen to these words in Hebrews 2 and 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. I wondered, have you ever met someone, or maybe you know someone who says something like this to you? Sometimes at night, I wake up and start crying. I'm so frightened of death. I'm so frightened of dying. And you know the stupidest thing you can say back to them is, don't be scared, it's not a problem. Of course it's a problem. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest problems that any human being faces. And as a minister, I have shared in many, many funerals. I've buried a lot of people. And I think back to my time before I came here in North Antrim and North Derry, where it was the practice to have a wake that usually went on for three or four days, sometimes even longer. And for three or four days between the death and the funeral, usually the house of the deceased would be opened and all and sundry would come. I can remember going to wakes where there were over a hundred people in the house and in the farmyard around the house. And there would be endless sandwiches and cakes for tea, and people would be put into different rooms. By the way, the minister was always put in with the women. I always found that strange. He wasn't allowed to be with the men. Maybe he would have sort of maybe calmed their language down a bit. I don't know. And if you were if you were a widow and, and your husband had died, um, it was quite a hard time from early morning sometimes to certainly very late at night, often after midnight, people would come and you'd have tea and sandwiches and cakes and biscuits and so on, and people would sympathize. There was a lovely part to it because the, the whole community, in a sense, were grieving together. But uh, I always went back the day after the funeral and always a week after the funeral, Uh, A day after, simply to say, I knew that the house would be empty by then, or almost empty, and it would be very different. And invariably, you would hear something like this, it's great to get back to normal, it's good to get back to real life. And I wanted to shout, this is not real life. Coming in from a hard day's work, turning the TV on to watch Coronation Street or whatever, is, is not real life. Real life is living knowing that death is coming. The unreality is when we forget that we are mortal, and we are afraid, and we're afraid of dying. And Paul recognizes that, and he says, but we are free. We are free from this. William Grimshaw, a young man, pledged, uh, uh, sorry, as a young man, he pledged to think of his own death every day of his life. That might seem a bit morbid to us. It might be a bit drastic, but certainly we should be thinking about that. One of my favorite writers, you'll be surprised at this, is uh, is Dostoevsky. I can hardly say that, but I think his books are amazing. The depth of describing the character of human beings in our brokenness and in our fears. His novels of such great depth, and I think I know why, because he faced a firing squad and he survived. Imagine facing a firing squad and surviving it. He knew what life and death was about. And Paul talks about death as departing to be with Jesus. And there's all kinds of picture words behind that word departing. It's, it's like the ship that lifts, the, uh, that takes up anchor, weighing anchor and heading out. It's like the oxen that are being set free from the plow, the prisoner that's set free from prison, all of those things. Even his, his calling as a tent maker has something there. He says it's, it's like when you die, it's like packing up your tent and going home. My camp life is good, isn't it? Those of us who have enjoyed it. But it's not normal life for most of us. And he says, life now is like camp life. He says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1, that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Now, here's an easy thing for me in the mornings. When I look in the mirror, 
in my bathroom, it's easy for me to say this body is going to fade. Probably more accurately, it's already fading. This body is going to rot. But this is just a tent. God is going to give me a new body, a glorious body. I suppose the nearest guess we have as to what it will be like is the ascended body of the risen Lord Jesus. Wow. We are free from that fear of death. Douglas Copeland says, Isn't it incredible how we spend our youth making money and our old age spending it to try to be young in our bodies? Our bodies will fade. And he says, so what? To die is gain, to live is Christ. I remember watching a movie. I think it's called 50 Days from Peking. It's probably way back in the 1960s, it was made about the Boxer Rebellion in China. And uh, the Boxers who rebelled in China had a number of very weird ideas. One of their ideas was that if they trained for 100 days, they were immune to bullets. And after 300 days, they would be able to fly. The problem was after 100 days, they tried the first option and it didn't work, so none of them ever flew. It was a false confidence but Christians don't have that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, before he died, wrote, this is the end for me, the beginning of life. Isn't that wonderful? This is the end for me, the beginning of life. And I don't have time to quote the catechism, but go to home and read it of what it says will happen to your body and to mine if we have trusted our lives and are following Jesus. I suppose the best way I've ever heard it being put is in the last battle that C.S. Lewis wrote, where Aslan turns to them at the very end and says, you do not yet look so happy as I mean you to be. They were Presbyterians, obviously. <laughs> and Lucy says to him, we're so afraid of being sent away, Aslan, and you've sent us back into our world so often. No fear of that, said Aslan. Have you not guessed? Their hearts leapt and a wild hope rose within them. There was, said Aslan softly, a real railway accident. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it, in the shadowlands, dead. And then these wonderful words, the term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. This is the morning. Yes, life is real for us but it's not the ultimate reality. Or this life, isn't it? Listen to what God is telling us here, that this life that is so fantastic and great and we rejoice in it is only the beginning. And by the way, this isn't a triumphalist view of death. We will mourn. We will be sad. We will miss people. But we have hope and we have freedom. John Piper says this, that when the future grace of being in Christ takes hold of you, it frees you from fear and gives courage to live the most radical, self-sacrificing life of love. Because you know you're on the Titanic, you can give up your seat on the, the, the boat that's going to take people to safety because you know where you're going as a believer. Rejoice in hope and rejoice in freedom. And thirdly and finally, rejoice in service, verses 25 and 26. Joyful service. Convinced of this, I know, I, I now remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Here's the choice for the Apostle Paul. He can go to be with the Lord, or he can stay and be a blessing to others through his service. And knowing that, isn't that such a, a, a motivation of our heart to be active in serving the Lord? It's what Jesus meant when he said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him or within her. It means great fruitfulness. Paul's saying, I can go, but I want to stay and serve because it's better for you. It's better for you. We are thinking, aren't we, on Sunday mornings of our commitment to the local church and to the church uh, worldwide and indeed to the church universal. It's a commitment to the church and the Lord's people. 
in these verses 25 and 26. So many of us have a, a, a kind of McDonald's view that there are other takeaways available, but a McDonald's view of Christianity and of church. What's in it for me? And by the way, I don't want to stand in a line. You need to deal with my needs first. Clear these other folk out of the way. And if you don't like the church that you happen to be in, well, sure, you can pick and mix from the internet, and you can decide where to go to and who to follow and all that sort of thing. But as I hope we are seeing in Sunday mornings, the church is the people of God, and every single one of us sitting or standing here are called to serve the church, and we do that first locally in our congregations. Any of us who have any kind of family at all knows how costly it is, as we were thinking this morning. It's messy, but that's what we're called to. And Paul said, I'm glad that I'm not going to die immediately and be with Jesus because I get to stay and serve you people. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have ended that sentence the way he does. I'm glad I'm not going to die because, uh, well, I quite like being here. And I'm a bit frightened of what's beyond there. Nobody's come back. Oh, but somebody has come back and told me what it's like. And he's always telling the truth, for he is truth. But he's saying... I'm here because I'm called to serve. Now, I, I'm preaching this to myself first before you. I've been thinking about this all week, this bit of it particularly. Lord, I don't want to die yet because there are 101 things that, that I want to do. Um, we, 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 Pat and I are, are, are uh, involved with a member of the family, and uh, when we meet that person, I'll say, well, it's a man or woman, because that might give it away to some of you. Uh, there's a sense of, here's a bucket list that I want to do before I go. And maybe, to be honest, I would have thought that way too until I had to look at these verses this week. But he's saying, I don't want to die because I want to stay and serve you and to help people. You see, fading is the worldling's pleasure, as the hymn puts it. Jeffrey Bull, a missionary to China when he was in prison, wrote this, How is it that so many saints down the ages have been able to live in triumph behind bars? It is because they have discovered the secret of freedom. It is the conscious cooperation with the living God in the fulfillment of the pure design for which he made us. The secret of living and dying well is about our relationship with Jesus Christ F.B. Meyer said, Christ is the essence of our life, the model of our life, the aim of our life, the solace of our life, and the reward of our life. Or as a recent book, a few years old now, puts it, Christian, or Christ, Jesus Christ plus nothing equals everything. It's a wonderful equation for those that are mathematically minded like me. Jesus Christ plus nothing equals everything. And so he says, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Not for me to live is money, for I'll leave it all behind. For me to live is fame, fame, because I'll die and be forgotten. For me to live is power, I'll die and lose it all. For me to live is things, I'll go empty-handed. And perhaps somebody here may not be a Christian tonight. And you're thinking exactly what I would have thought until I was 17 years of age. I'd love to be a Christian, but I'd like to do it about a week before I die. I want to enjoy everything I can and then give my life to Jesus just before I go. But fading's the worldling's pleasure. Solid joys and lasting treasures, none but Zion's children go. I don't often quote Robbie Burns, but he did say, the snow that falls in the river, a moment white, then melts forever. All of it turns to dust. I'm thinking a lot about Johnny Cash. We watched a program about Johnny Cash last week, and uh, only that I wanted to preach so long, I was going to put, put the DVD up here of Hurt. Maybe you'll do it some night. It's one of those striking things, if you haven't seen it, uh, of an old man who, who, who died within the year of making it. It's an amazing, an amazing tribute to the fragility of life. I, I recommend, of course, you can look at it on the net, I'm sure, download it somewhere. YouTube's bound to have it somewhere. Hurt Johnny Cash. It all turns to dust. 
So if you don't follow Jesus, what would keep you away from doing that? A pile of dust? A memory that will fade when your grandchildren and great-grandchildren go and no one will remember you? Chances are. What keeps you away? Do you think you're going to do it before you go? Well, you see, the solid joys that Christians enjoy sometimes for 10 years or 20 years or 80 years or even more, this side of glory are nothing, are, are, are everything in comparison to a pile of dust. It would be terrible to think that God had brought you to a church like this to hear his message and you decided it was much more important to watch Coronation Street or a football match or bet at the boogies, or whatever it might be, good, bad, or indifferent, and to live for that. I'm here, Jesus is saying, don't put me away for someone else or something else. Almost done. What about the wonderful words of John 11 and 23, and I'm more or less done now. Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe it? Paul certainly did. Don't talk as a Christian to other people about dying and death as if it was the end. It serves you. It serves me. If you believe in Jesus, you already have eternal life. Wonderful. You can't die. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't die. Your body can go on. You can't die. An extraordinary thing, an amazing thing, a wonderful thing, that we will be given new resurrection bodies. And this life is just a preparation for what is to come. And that's why we can be filled with joy for sure and certain hope that we have, for the freedom that we enjoy, that we no longer have that fear of what lies beyond death, even though it may be a painful experience for us, as it is for many, going through that process of dying. And we have this wonderful joy, because until then, we're practicing for what is to come. We're called to serve one another and to serve our Lord. I just simply want to say that I trust absolutely what Jesus says when he says he is the resurrection of the life. My mother and I have conversations at least twice a week when she says, son, I just want to go and be with the Lord. And I said, listen, mom, I just wish you could. But he knows. I don't know. And her mother went to sleep one night full of faith and didn't waken up, and that's my mother's prayer. And I suppose that's many of our prayers. Just go to bed, have a cup of tea, as she did, and she didn't waken up. The next morning, she was in glory. What a confidence we can have. As a Christian, you and I, as Christians, you and I have been given salvation, not so that we can be selfish about it, but so that we can share it. And I hope that your confidence, like mine, is that Christ will be exalted in our bodies despite all our sins, and mine are many, and our shortcomings. May that be for you. And will you pray that that would be for me? May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful confidence of the gospel that our hope is in Jesus, who has conquered every enemy and has risen and even now is Lord of heaven and earth, seated at your right hand. We thank you that all authority is given to him in heaven and earth, even authority over death. We thank you for the wonderful gift of the good news of the life-giving Holy Spirit who has changed us and given us faith to believe. And we thank you for this wonderful message that we can rejoice in hope that is certain. We can rejoice in the freedom that nothing will separate us from the love of God in this life or the next. And we can rejoice that while we are here, we can serve one another and you and bring you great joy because of what Jesus did for us and does for us in this rich salvation. To him be praise and glory, world without end. Amen.
Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.